All right. Okay. Uh, thanks for everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing with um, uh, Dr. John Honia. He's uh, on the faculty at Emerson College. Yes, there is a little science program at Emerson College. Um, and uh, he, his background is that um, he worked on salmon out in the Pacific Northwest, uh, looking at um, uh, dam removal and stuff like that. He was actually a um, postdoc with Ray Hilborn, so he's pretty pretty knowledgeable in uh, in that field. Um, he came to me a couple of years ago because um, he was interested in my um, uh, alewife model that I had worked uh, put together um, for a grant with uh, Ben Gahagan and Mike Armstrong. Uh, which I get published, uh, came out this past uh, February. And um, he was interested in using that to look at um, uh, the potential uh, population responses of uh, blueback herring in the uh, Shawshine River, which is a tributary to the Merrimack River. Um, my model wasn't really designed to do what he wanted to do. So I, um, started from scratch with blueback and, and developed this model, which I'm gonna show you. you now, um, it, it, our work isn't complete yet. John had to take a hiatus because of COVID. He has to teach online and he's got kids and everything. So um, this is some of the work we've done up to date. Um, so with, uh, I think most people, uh, when they think about dam removal, uh, they think about trying to restore uh, some habitat uh, that, that has been closed off to some fish like uh, the anadromous fish, like the, the herrings and stuff, with the expectation that if we take the dam down, um, it opens up more habitat. And, and uh, given the habit, more habitat, we should be producing more young and have a, a nice positive response and population growth to what historically, hopefully what historically had occurred in, in that particular watershed. Um, however, uh, even the, because we open up more habitat, if you will, in, in a given watershed, it doesn't always mean that we'll have a proportional um, our response because uh, hab habitat quality is, isn't all equal within those systems and, and fish uh, exhibit preferences for habitats. And uh, if those habitats aren't really available, once they're reopened, um, there may not be any response for, uh, at all, um, particularly if there's uh, you know, differential survival of young in different habitats and there may not be any uh, uh, response given, given that the habitat uh, capacity, carrying capacity, whatever, hasn't really um, added anything. Um, we, we were, in developing this model, we were interested in how potentially, how fast that um, our population uh, may respond to using new habitat. Um, and so we developed this um, model to look at um, some of the fish behavior that could be occurring once uh, uh, habitat has opened up. Uh, in particular, um, we wondered whether there, um, how fast this population could respond if, uh, for instance, if uh, some uh, bluebacks or whatever, uh, other anadromous fish, whether uh, there is some type of homing that given that a dam has been down for so long, and they're, they've over decades, they've spawned in the same habitat. Even if the dam was open, would, would they stick around in that habitat or would they uh, consider moving into all the uh, portions of the, the river that have been opened up? Um, we had questions on how did they explore once the dam comes down? Are they imme immediately responding to this uh, new open area? Do they... Uh, search around for, uh, you know, the quality habitat that they have preference for, or is it a really slow, gradual process? Um, 
I also, uh, there's some questions we're looking uh, at about um, spawning behavior and whether um, if, if in particular, like uh, uh, anadromous species like uh, blueback, uh, we wondered if there has, if there has to be some type of minimum aggregate uh, numbers in a spawning aggregation um, in order to have successful reproduction. And if, you know, these groups, uh, there has to be a minimum uh, group and the population's low at the start, um, how, how rapidly could a population respond given that there's a constraint on how many they need in order to be successfully, uh, to successfully produce, reproduce, sorry. Um, so we had a lot of questions in mind. So we developed, I developed this model uh, with the pr uh, purpose of uh, trying to uh, simulate some of uh, uh, responses uh, uh, in the Shawshank River. Um, the model is uh, spatially explicit. Uh, most of the relationships are empirically based. It includes all life stages and simulates dynamics uh, over a daily time step. On the left uh, slide, you can, this is the, um, uh, just the diagram of the, the different uh, portions of the immature and adult populations that are modeled. They, there's three regions, they live in the ocean, they emigrate into the estuary in the spring, and then they move into the river where they spawn. Uh, the, the rate at which they move in is dependent on uh, swimming speed, uh, the growth in the different areas now for the immature adults, unlike the alewife, now is all governed by bioenergetic equations, which uh, uh, temperature is a direct input into uh, the growth models. And then we have uh, separate sub models for the egg yolk sac and young of the year. Um, but now, uh, because of where we, we wanted to look at the Shawshank River, specifically, uh, the river space is uh, very detailed now. Um, in the Yellowwife model, I used uh, R to program, but since we're dealing, dealing with some spatial, uh, the spatial aspect, um, I just decided to use this uh, individual based uh, modeling environment known as NetLogo, which is uh, free from um, uh, Northwestern University and you can find it on the website. Uh, in NetLogo, um, you have what's called a world, which you have individuals known as agents or in individuals that, are, uh, that will move around in this particular world. They can move, do whatever. Uh, in that logo, they're actually called turtles for some reason, but uh, I think you think of them as just an individual. And they can move around in a world and interact with uh, the environment that's within this world. So you can define uh, patches uh, within that world that have different characteristics. In this example, this was a, a case of um, looking at wolf predation on sheep that then our, the sheep are, um, uh, are survived based on whether there's grass, which is the green and, and brown, which is uh, denuded uh, uh, land. So, oops. Uh, our world is the Shawshank River, which is a, a tributary to the Merrimack River. And on the left is um, a uh, schematic of the, uh, river uh, connected to the Merrimack, and then the Merrimack's connected to the ocean. It's not to scale. Um, the, we modeled uh, in space, we modeled the um, main stem of the uh, Shawshank River and also the primary and secondary tributaries to, uh, uh, to the, the main stem. Uh, there's a dam, I, I forget the name of it, around this uh, area here and below the dam, there's about 88, 88 acres of spawning habitat or at least where uh, bluebacks have been found. And above that dam, there's about 196 acres uh, available uh, of different habitat qualities and stuff. Each cell in our world is uh, 200 meters long 
but the widths vary depending on uh, the location, which were based on GIS. And uh, each, um, each cell has a different water, uh, water velocity and temperature based on um, characteristics that uh, John developed using this uh, book here, which uh, was published by the USGS. Uh, this figure in the middle just shows you that, uh, one particular cell, which I coded in black, and you, it all has these characteristics like width, the area, velocity, temperature, and we simulate water velocity and temperature on a daily basis so that those change over time. Our agents uh, in the model represents what are called platoons. That's from literature in the 80s, but uh, individual based mo modeling people since the 90s call them super individuals and what a, a platoon just represents um, uh, an agent it's a single agent but the agent represents uh, more than one uh, individual fish in this case so um, in the platoon and that's basically what a platoon literature is um, so we have uh, platoons for the mature and immature fishes and there's a hundred length-based platoons per age and sex. And we keep track of sex, uh, sexes, ages, their length, when they enter the uh, estuary, when they enter the river, when they leave, and when they spawn, all that, those kind of characteristics. And you can see on the, the right here, uh, this is just, uh, if you click on one of the uh, agents, you can see all the characteristics associated with it. Once the uh, fish spawn, um, the eggs within a particular cell are uh, track, uh, tracked over time. And then once they can hatch and they uh, turn into yolk sac larvae, and then uh, once, you know, once they absorb the yolk, they become uh, post larvae. And we, we keep a track of the same batch of uh, individuals over time. This just shows an interface uh, that you develop uh, in that logo, you can have all these different graphs and stuff, which really helps because it help, it really helps um, uh, uh, t testing model and finding coding errors and things like that. So uh, it's actually pretty pretty neat uh, software. So in the model, uh, to get uh, mature fish into the rivers. Um, we used a lot of uh, the Monument River data. We tried to get data as close to the Shawshank, like in the Parker and stuff like that. Um, but when those aren't available, we moved to the, the river that actually has data, which is mostly the Monument. Uh, so we, we get, we randomly uh, uh, pick a day when the fish can start moving. We uh, develop uh, a time series of probabilities uh, that uh, different groups move into the river based on uh, relationship between run start, run length, when the peak in the and the run occurs, and and for the bluebacks we actually did incorporate uh, and and allow uh, males uh, to come in earlier than females because uh, that's been observed in many systems. Uh, for the spawning habitat, you know we have these individuals looking for. Uh, a suitable habitat for spawning. We developed the, these, um, the suitability based on temperature and velocity um, and the values uh, we got out of the literature. And these just show the relationships between um, the uh, suitability uh, for temperature and velocity. And uh, this slide, if you just move from left to right, uh, this just uh, shows a plot of uh, for different days, um, the gradient in area, which, uh, which is uh, shows that the, the whitest here means the highest and black means the lowest value. You can see that the largest areas are in the main stem and the uh, less so in the primary and secondary tributaries. Uh, velocity, it's higher velocity in the main stem than in the tributaries. Uh, Temperature is cooler at the headwaters up the top and warmer near the mouth. And then this is just one particular day um, to express, show the ranges of the suitability that could occur. Um, and this particular day, the highest suitability were actually in the tributaries themselves, uh, the primary and secondary tributaries to the Shawshank. 
Uh, so when, once uh, males and females are going to spawn um, come in, we, we have a set of rules for them to find the particular suitable habitat. Um, and uh, it's based on in, in that logo, there's a bunch of these functions, there's a bunch of functions that allow you to search around um, the, your world, depending on uh, what you want to do. So we have it programmed so that uh, uh, a, a, a platoon uh, on a given day, if it's not ready to spawn, will search for the area of highest suitability within a given radius around that uh, platoon. And that's based, that uh, radius is based on the body length and how fast it can move in a given day. Um, but there also, and I'll get to this later, there also has to be enough room for this platoon, the number of individuals in this platoon to fit into that cell. Um, and, and that was uh, what I mentioned a little bit earlier, if there's, you know, how many fish can actually fit into the cell. So we have uh, a user specified limit they can enter. Um, and so once they find a patch, they move there, but if they don't find a, a, a more suitable patch, they stay put. Um, once they move, if there's, they can identify some spawning uh, females, they'll spawn and the males uh, stay within their uh, reaches of the river for a pre-assigned uh, length of time. And then once that time is reached, they move back out. And for the females, they they find a they they have the, the same thing they look for the radius around the radius looking for males and um, if when they find them and if they're ready to spawn uh, they have to uh, have uh, the numbers before they move there has to be enough uh, uh, room for them to move to the site to maintain a particular minimum uh, ratio between males and females so in the literature most of the um, males uh, uh, during spawning, it's been noticed that most uh, the ratio between males and females skewed towards males. You generally one or uh, one female with five five males. So uh, this was our uh, attempt to uh, try to maintain at least a one to one ratio. It's uh, it's almost impossible to do maintain like five to one, but there's a range of values in the literature that people uh, have observed. So uh, we have go just to at least maintain a minimum of one male to one female. Um, so if there's enough room and there's uh, enough, uh, not enough females, they can move to that patch, else, otherwise they stay put. And if they're ready to spawn, uh, we have them spawning only once and then they leave the river um, the, the day after they spawn. Unfortunately, we know alewives are batch spawners, but it hasn't been really described for uh, bluebacks, so we just had them spawn once. And for the uh, egg and yolk sac and young of the year dynamics, we have a program. So uh, once a, a fish spawn and the eggs are released, they can actually drift in the system based on velocity. Um, and there's hatching and, and uh, temperature relationships, hatching success, daily mortality that control the numbers. And then uh, when those eggs hatched, uh, a hatch, we actually have uh, the yolk sac larvae just stay in that habitat where they're hatched. And they, uh, once they absorb their yolk sac, uh, they uh, experience a carrying capacity based on the, the assumption that, you know, the when they first start feeding, that's the most vulnerable uh, stage and that the, the theory about mismatch hypothesis, which shows a lot of mortality because they just can't find the food or aren't uh, used to feeding at a particular point. And there's mortality applied to them and all the uh, uh, post larvae and young uh, grow based on a bioenergetics model and uh, young of the year emigrate out of the system based on uh, a probability model derived from Monument River data. This just shows, so during the model, is a, we do a lot of calibration using different data to tweak parameters in the model to mimic what we see in the field. Uh, but there's also data sets that we don't use and we, we use that as a verification. And what this slide just shows 
starting at the top left of the age distribution of females. And we do a pretty good job of matching that to the age distribution from the Mystic River. And then the, uh, on the right is the males. And down below C and D are the length distributions uh, for the mature fish. And we, we do a pretty good job at mimicking those. And at the bottom are sex ratios uh, from the model compared to monument mystic. And we're kind of in between those. And then uh, at the bottom in F, uh, the younger the year growth produced by the model is within the range that uh, was observed in the uh, Monument River by Euphrates and uh, Oliveira. So we, that's pretty good. And then on, in the ocean, uh, the only data we had uh, were from the, our trial survey, but also Connecticut. And our predictions of uh, modes are pretty good, which uh, of at least the first mode is we think is age one. Um, and we do a good job of predicting that. But uh, that second mode in Connecticut deep, I don't know what that is. That could be age twos, but we're not matching that. In ours, we just see, uh, and this is at, these are averages over time. Uh, we we seem to to uh, uh, mimic the, at least the the basic uh, uh, large grouping of the first few length uh, intervals. So we we think it's doing a good job. So we want to look at a bunch of, of things. And um, we were wondering how population um, growth uh, would occur uh, looking at, uh, we have six, one, two, three, four, five different um, uh, parameters. And the first one is spawning density because that question of is, if uh, you have a required number of fish um, that can fit into a particular uh, habitat, um, if they have a preference, uh, will all of those fish, you know, if, it's, if they find the highest suitable habitat, will all the fish move into that? So we looked at uh, different levels to try and constrain how many can actually look and in, uh, go into a particular habitat. And, and that has implications that if you have everything piled, all the fish piled up into one, let's say cell, because it's the highest, prep, uh, highest suitability, will, um, could that, could that cause high mortality in young if there's like a, a carrying capacity issue within that cell? So we looked at three different levels. Um, we also looked at ground speed because one of the issues, as I mentioned, was how do these fish search? So if they enter the river, uh, river and the dams down and, and they don't explore very far because they're used to being in a particular region or um, they they reach a, a, a highly suitable site right away, they may not move around a lot and explore. So we looked at um, ground speed, um, different levels of ground speed to see uh, what would happen um, if you had uh, very little movement at 0.3 and then uh, 0.9 uh, body length per second, which uh, uh, means that at that speed for a given day, a, a fish could uh, search almost uh, half of the river uh, within the day. And then the third uh, was habitat selection. So we looked at, you know, given that those suitabilities assumes that the fish have a preference and they'll go there. In the other case, we said, well, what if there's no preference at all? What will happen? And then uh, in the literature, there's some uh, descriptions of how some fish respond to uh, to when dams, uh, the response when dams come down, and particularly in some cyprinids, they they're shown to essentially move right to the headwaters uh, of that uh, new river, whether to spawn or not, it's not known. So we wondered in the Shawshin if um, how when when do these fish start to to look for habitat, new habitat if they start at the mouth. Um, well, let me just back up and just say, so uh, So we wondered the start of the search, whether it occurs right when they enter at the mouth or would would it would they move up to the headwaters just like some of those site printers and others and then start to look for habitat. So um, we had a scenario for that. And then we looked at um, the post larvae carrying capacity um, and what effects that can have. And some of our, uh, back calculation, we 
try to develop uh, some actual values for that. And they range from uh, like 35 to 140 uh, fish per meter squared for this particular river. So we looked at just 40 and 80, which 40 is low and 80 is about mid. Uh, so we did all combinations. There were 72 combinations. We simulated, uh, we did 100 simulations per uh, combination. And uh, the initial, uh, the initialization of the model, we, we had projected with a dam up uh, for 30 years, we just ran the model on a base case to get the numbers uh, uh, of the delts and, and, and things that would be spawning and use that as the uh, uh, initial values. And um, we kept the dam up for 10 years. The, uh, we, we had tuned it so that there were only uh, 4,300 fish, which, which we had estimated below the dam. And um, when, so we ran the, the model for 10 years with the dam up, and then we took the dam down and all the different scenarios were then applied and, to, and then the model was continued to run for another 20 years to see what the response would be. And here's just some examples of what we got. So uh, the graph on the left uh, is looking at the change in abundance from year 10 before the dam came down and then uh, compared to the abundance changes after that, the rows represent from uh, the uh, spawners per meter squared, but going from low in the top to high on the bottom. And then the uh, columns represent the ground speeds uh, for searching. And within each of those graphs, um, there are several lines. And you can see the uh, legend at the bottom uh, where we have R1 and R2 simply means uh, random uh, movement and no no preferences, no use of the suitability. And uh, one is starting at the mouth and two is starting at the headwaters. And then P1 and P2 are the preference uh, behaviors starting at the mouth for one and, and then starting at the headwaters. Um, on the, the graph on the right, the same um, uh, organization, except this represents the survival ratio of the young of the year um, based on uh, using the numbers of age one at January one the next year uh, and, and dividing that by the eggs that were uh, uh, produced uh, during that previous year. Uh, so if we start on the left at a current capacity of 40, uh, the, the most rapid increase was uh, uh, for the case uh, scenario uh, of R1, meaning uh, no preference and uh, starting at the mouth and slower responses um, uh, for the other cases. And this is at a ground speed of three. So what's happening is they're, the area, they cannot take more advantage of the area at these uh, different behaviors because the, the movement is uh, so small. And if we increase the ground speed uh, going across the columns, uh, the differences between uh, that uh, the first random uh, no preference uh, uh, scenario, these uh, the the rates of increase start to become similar uh, as that uh, the ground speed the, the more they search and they can find areas so there's uh, more benefit uh, and less uh, crowding uh, uh, that occurs at the lower ground speed and if we go over to the survival you can. Survival ratio, you can see what happening. Um, the the more uh, the survival of the fish at some of those uh, uh, other uh, scenarios is lower for like the uh, the R two starting at um, the mouth. Uh, sorry, the headwaters. Um, you can see that's lower. So you, uh, obviously, it's higher mortality, lower survival. Um, and so you don't get much of an increase, but as um, the ground speed increases, the mortality becomes about the same. So we, you get the same increase in abundance. But as you move down, uh, going back to change of abundance, as you move and increase the number of spawners uh, that occur within a given cell, the uh, at least for the uh, P1 and P2s, you get a, a really rapid D 
decline. And that's because these fish are clustering within a given cells and there is a young of the carrying capacity. So by crowding, getting crow more crowded within that cell, they're producing a higher number of eggs which are uh, dying because of that capacity. So your uh, mortality is a lot higher and you can see that in the uh, right-hand graph at the bottom for survival ratios, how that uh, with ground speed too, if you go down, go down the uh, rows and then the columns, you can see how there's a much lower survival uh, at those um, higher uh, adult densities within the given cells. And so this is just showing um, the post larval carrying capacity at 80. You get a much uh, faster response. I forgot to mention that initially that there's uh, not a response because if they're in the first year, if the dam comes down and it's beneficial, there's a lot more habitat beneficial. You won't see any response until like three years because those young who survive better aren't uh, coming into like age into the river until like age three. Um, but you can see uh, the um, rates rates to improve in the same kind of pattern. Um, you do you do uh, do get separation between the behaviors. Like uh, uh, it doesn't really matter uh, if you go down to the uh, bottom row and across. You can see that the uh, the rates of increase in population changes get separated into two groups, and that's just the um, the random just searching, and then the preferences. And it's the same case here where uh, it's due to uh, the individuals piling up. Um, the uh, under the preferences, um, there's they're not the preferences is fewer. Um, ways to move. So they get, again, they're getting piled up. So you get a higher mortality, whereas opposed to the random, they just can go anywhere and uh, not worry about, uh, uh, and, the, and sorry. And then uh, that uh, mortality based on the crowding isn't uh, really taking place. I didn't show it, but there is a difference in how uh, the patchiness of the distribution of the individuals. So at random, with no preference, they're kind of spread out. But when there is a preference, you do get these patchiness, but at a spawning level of uh, uh, 0 .0, 0 0.05 individual per square meter, um, that clumping isn't really affecting it so much, but as you increase the numbers within a given cell, the adults anyway, that mortality is increasing. So, uh, that's as far as we got so far. John had a, a stop because of uh, COVID. He's got to teach online and he's got kids to deal with and everything. So that's as far as we got so far. So we're going to be doing some more, more work, but the results I showed you are probably over optimistic because when we do assume that there aren't any habitat structure changes, the same velocity occurs in the same cell, all this stuff. And um, we thought about trying to model the changes, but you know, there's some quotes and uh, people trying to do that. And one quote here by Pizzuto, 2002 in bioscience says it's it's practically impossible <laughs> to try try and uh, model exactly how uh, uh, stream channels will change given removal of the dams. And um, and there's actually been some surprises. Uh, some of the publications I read, uh, looking after dam removal, there were there were surprises in how uh, quality of habitat improved where they didn't think it would and stuff like that. And, and then it takes a long time for fish to actually respond um, to changes. And we, in this model, uh, we thought we model it to do an immediate response. You know, the habitat's open. If they get to it, they can use it. Whereas that may not be true because habitat uh, will be evolving and changing over time. So. Um, the distribution will be affected by that and the habitat quality will be affected like that. So we do have some uh, big assumptions. And some of the additional work we want to do right now, there's no direct link between the preferred habitat and like uh, carrying capacity. So we're going to uh, develop a relationship with that to see what happens. Um, 
the current results that I showed you. Uh, the there is the eggs do not drift, and then once they're uh, laid, they just stay in that area. But uh, we have in the model where you can uh, uh, have eggs drift. So we want to see what would happen if fish are preferring a particular site, uh, the delts anyway, uh, where those eggs go, and um, whether there's a benefit uh, to that. And of course, there's no variability in the carrick passage, which probably changes day to day and year to year. But uh, we have that program. We just we had, didn't show that. Um, and one of the uh, big issues, when you put the models together, you realize how little we actually know <laughs> about particular species. Um, and for bluebacks, compared to the airwives, uh, the data and the literature are pretty limited. Uh, and we need a lot more information. Um, we had a, for bluebacks, we had to borrow uh, uh, parameters and, and relationships from alewife a lot because there aren't any available for bluebacks. Um, so uh, if anyone's <laughs> interested in what needs to be done in terms of research, there's, there's plenty, plenty of stuff to do. Um, and other research could be like uh, looking at how bluebacks are uh, searching spawning grounds and, and how, how do they determine where they're going to uh, go? You know, um, do they move into one area that they think is preferred and just stay there, or they they keep moving around until they're ready to to spawn, and then find the the best habitat? Um, also, I, we just use temperature and velocity. I'm sure there's other types of habitat characteristics that they probably select, and. Um, also, you know, densities, uh, at least in the model, are important. So um, there's hardly any descriptions of uh, densities in uh, any rivers. So it might be a good uh, project to try and determine uh, what the, uh, you know, the densities uh, have to be or, or are in terms of when they're spawning. So, so this uh, uh, last thing, and I'll stop. Um, this is just a, a the graphic you'll uh, showing how the model uh, uh, works on, the, on a spatial basis, and you can view this while you're sitting in the net logo thing. And I'm going to uh, uh, so we have all different symbols depending on the life stage um, and maturity or and sex of individuals. So you'll see these change. And at the bottom, notice that I don't know if you can see it. Hopefully, you can see it. The light blue is the ocean, and there's red and gray in there, and those represent the mature and immature males and females that stay in the ocean. You'll see all these red dots, the blue uh, blue dots, move into the estuary, which is the blue rectangle there. They'll stay in it for a little bit until um, the uh, they're ready to to move in. Based on um, I showed you the the data we got from the Monument River. And then you'll see it move around. And in this particular scenario, they move to the headwaters first and then do their searching. And then you'll see uh, eggs hatch will be the pink dots. And then uh, the oak sac, uh, once they hatch, they're in the yellow squares. And then once they uh, start feeding, they become these post larvae you know, and the, these little fish here. So let's see if this works. going to work. Yep, there it goes. So, and then they'll move it up to the headwaters. You see them moving around in the abundance. And then the females and males will start moving out. You'll see them decrease. And then eventually the young of the year uh, will start to move out based on uh, Monument River data. Um, and eventually they all, all move out. Uh, and move it to the ocean by January 1. So, so it's kind of cool uh, environment if you're dealing with spatial stuff because you can do a lot of debugging based simply on patterns that you're looking at. So that's it, that's all I got. Any questions? Thanks, Mike. Hey Gary, I have a question. Michael. Um, 
So it looks like the carrying capacity for, I guess, was that the larvae or yolk sac? Yeah, it's that first feeding mortality that we take off the top because you know, the mismatch hypothesis stuff. Yeah. So it looks like that was the most sensitive. Your the results were most sensitive to that variable. Yeah, I um, mean that makes sense because the more that can survive in a given habitat, the more individuals you're going to get out of the population. So do you think that there is? Well, have there been studies to sort of evaluate that at a maximum like density, um, or can you? think of a way to devise an experiment to sort of evaluate whether that is real or whether that it's in a realistic value range. If that's the most yeah. important driving variable, is there something? Well, those values we did use that? were in a range that we calculated by using um, the estimated number of uh, adults in the river, um, some age frequency data to back calculate, to, to get the number of eggs um, that potentially spawned and then using some survival estimates in the egg and the, the larval stages to calculate what the post larvae had to be. Um, and the range went from 35 to 147 fish per meter square. So, um, so that's our best guess. Uh, but I, I don't know of anybody who done anything like that. At least I can't recall. Maybe the, the real river herring people might know something. Right, so that's a distribution of what is available to you currently. Yeah. But like if, if you're bumping up against a carrying capacity, um, is that, are those values showing what a carrying capacity would be or would they show you what like the distribution of densities are currently in a model system? Mm. Because the carrying capacity yeah. is a limit. It's a maximum. Right, right. And we're saying we're trimming them. We're, we're trimming that, that base. We're using this carrying capacity to say that's the maximum number of larvae that can be in that particular patch. Right. Um, and so to get that, then the numbers of uh, first feeding larvae have to be truncated in order to get down to that. So that's what how we're modeling that. There may be a better way of doing that, but that's the only one come, come up and that's what I use in that alewife model. Um, so there has to be some type of carrying capacity or the population would just explode and just keep going. Right. So that was our best guess and how to do that. Does that answer your question? I'm not really Well, sure. yeah, that's why I was just, you know, that what struck me is that that was a major driver. And, yeah. it, you know, given the state of river herring currently, whether our local observations are actually relevant to carrying capacity. I'm just wondering if there's a way to sort of test that with like maybe experimental ponds or something like that, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, see what sort of maximum amount is possible. Because yeah, it I think seems like be, that. I think it would be system dependent too, you know, a lot of, if it's based on food and prey density and, and stuff right. like that. Yeah, know. yeah. But I mean, uh, that's, I don't think it's ever been done in lakes. We're just, I mean, in rivers and just go and measure the density. I mean, there's some, there's like a study in North Carolina that did some plankton stuff, but to go into backwaters and stuff like that to sample if, if that's where the, the fish are going, you know. That, that, yeah, you'd have to find a system where you think it would be, have possibility of being saturated yeah. by eggs to say what the carrying capacity would be. Right, right. That's difficult. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing. Uh, so so what do you think of uh, net logo as far as like a learning curve and being using yeah, it a, to get to, for your purpose? It's a um, bit of a challenge there. This is like a dictionary that they have online and stuff that explains the functions and what they do. Um, but there's not much of uh, a help with examples, you know, if you wanted to do this, do this. So what you have to do, I bought several books, um, some of the Volcker books that do individual waste modeling using that logo, using their examples, but also there's a big community. And if I had questions, 
um, you could just you know, uh, ask a question at the uh, Google community thing. And um, that helped a lot. But a lot of stuff is just trial and error just to get data into, you know, our system data, like the river stuff, just to get it in was, it took me weeks to try and figure it up because it's not, they do things really different in this language. It's just not what I was used to. And the syntax is different, spaces matter. Um, that kind of stuff. So you had to get used to a different, it's a different language, really. And the way you, you act, there's a, a, a function name called ask. You know, you have to, in order to get some information off a patch, you have to ask the patch for, you know, the information. So you have to, and then uh, you can't ask a fish to, no, how does it, well, anyway, there's some, things you can't do between the agents and the uh, patches unless you use a specific um, format and stuff like that. So it takes a little while to, to get used to it. Any other questions? Hey Gary, it's Tracy. Hi Trace. Hey, um it's the model would you be able to put into it something along the lines of like predator effects or even competition and i can't remember the biology well enough to remember if they compete with alewives for spawning habitat but uh well i think there is a little overlap sometimes i believe bluebacks do move into lakes and stuff and um i'm not sure if alewives do spawn in rivers but here we just have it uh they only spawn in the river. So it's, uh, I, I suppose we could, we'd have to model alewives too and have different preferences and stuff like that, which to add another species wouldn't be too bad. It, although the, the runtime on this um, is quite long. Uh, for one, uh, it takes, I had, th for the scenarios I showed you, the 72, I had, um, three instances of NetLogo running on two computers and it took two and a half weeks to run all of the, all the scenarios. So adding more information is, is doable, but the runtime is really gonna be um, uh, lo much longer and uh, yeah, I'd have to, have to figure that out. And you would need something like a bigger supercomputer or something for it. I can't hear you, sorry. I, you would need something bigger, like a supercomputer, to add that much more complexity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. But the model, the guts of the the software, the model that you're using, can incorporate something like a predator effect. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's actually interesting. If you go to NetLogo site, there's all these uh, different examples of uh, using it from different fields. So there's a bunch of biology looking at how ants find, track down uh, food sources. Um, it, it's really pretty cool. Uh, I recommend go, go and download it just to play around with that stuff because uh, there's someone looking at fish school, uh, birds, how they flock. And I, at one time, just played around with that and made it fish schooling. And so it's actually, it's actually pretty cool. And there is, although I only showed you the 2D part, they do have a 3D segment now, which I've never played around with. So um, that's available. So there's kind of some cool stuff associated with the, the, the environment. So, and I see Mike, I'm sorry, David had a question. Why does the mode of the ocean Connecticut um, not seem to match the second peak? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if that, that's a real peak. Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm in one of your, uh, one of the plots that you had up there, right? It, it had the, the model overlaying the uh, the bins there, the population bins, and it didn't look like the model hit that second yeah, mode yeah. at all. Yeah. Yeah, I have no <clears throat> idea what that is. Um, um, we don't usually see that too often in our, uh, our survey. So um, again, I, I try to borrow data wherever I could get it. And I'm sure it does, won't exactly match. You know, it could have been um, a mixture of uh, alewives and bluebacks and that. Uh, I don't know. 
Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, Gary, this is Sam. I've got a quick question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering um, how you arrived at your final suitability for each cell. You have the variables, um, area, velocity, and temperature. And I was just wondering, are those um, equally weighted or is the suitability, suitability some function of those three? Uh, we didn't do area. We just... A cell, so you have this, uh, uh, the relationships between the temperature and velocity. So on a daily basis, they can change in a cell. So once they do, we go back and use those relationships to get the um, suitability for each of those cells. Um, so it changed individually, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, well, uh, maybe I'll just catch up with you. <laughs> I, I, I just didn't quite follow, but thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Thanks. Um, so next week, um, Who's up? Oh, Scott Elsey is going to be talking about uh, or giving an overview of the age and growth program. So um, come back next week. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Hope everyone's well. <laughs>